49% of Americans say they have trust and confidence in the United States Supreme Court. When Bill Clinton was president, that number was 80%. The absolute nosedive in American confidence in this court pulled this year in September followed reports that Justices Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito had routinely received lavish gifts and vacations from billionaire conservative activists and came at a time when the court itself ended federal protection for reproductive choice, ended the practice of race-conscious admissions decisions, and all but sanctioned discrimination against same-sex couples. This term, the court will make even more landmark decisions, including potentially whether to impose further restrictions on abortion access and whether the federal criminal case against Donald Trump can proceed. Joining me now is Mark Joseph Stern, senior writer covering the courts and the law for Slate magazine. Mark, thank you for joining me. I just first let me get your reaction to this New York Times reporting and what stood out to you as a court watcher as most egregious. Yeah, you know, we expect log rolling horse trading and deal making from politicians in the Senate cloakroom. But what we saw from the Supreme Court justices while deliberating this decision was something else entirely. This looked a lot like raw, cynical, partisan politicking of the basest sort. Uh, it was incredibly dishonest. The court concealed uh, its vote on this case from the public, as Adam pointed out moments ago. That is uh, almost unprecedented and suggest that this court did not trust the public uh, to learn the truth about its decision-making process because it had been so corrupted. Um, I think that's one of uh, many details that jumped out as indications that, you know, this court is cloaked in scandal, is cloaked in distrust of the public, and is aggressively trying to change the law with a lot of arrogance and a very little caution toward how the public is going to receive it. Yeah, the arrogance, that's so, that's a, such an appropriate term here because even reporting on the court, as I'm sure you're well aware, is so challenging, right? There's like, there's almost no access to the behind the scenes deliberation when these nine unelected justices are making decisions with a massive impact for American society. Do you see, I mean, the, 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 sort of the subtext of this piece is sort of questions whether these judges should have the power they do and the lifetime appointments they do. The bedside vigil of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg is but one of many examples about how questionable these sort of this arrangement is. Do you think we're at a, a, an inflection point here? Well, so long as the court kept roughly in tune with public opinion, then people weren't asking those questions. Uh, what's happened now is that the court has, of course, lurched to the right, far away from the median voter, and people are wondering, maybe for the first time in their lives, why do we allow these nine unelected politicians in robes to have the final say over essentially every major political and legal question of our time, especially when they're appointed in such a random fashion? I mean, every other country thinks we're crazy for allowing the vagaries of mortality to decide which way the court will lean. Um, I, I will say, you know, Congress has shown some interest in starting to increase regulation of the court with Republicans blockading all of those bills. It's not going to go anywhere soon. But this is the kind of thing that Congress could theoretically uh, try to put a stop to. The secrecy behind the scenes, the secrecy of these votes on taking up cases, a lot of legal ethics professors have said Congress should make that stop. Congress should require those votes to be public. Congress should force the justices to reveal what's going on behind the scenes because that's the bare minimum they can do to be transparent with this power that they wield. But of course, this court has shown no interest in doing so. Well, and as an example of that, the Mississippi Solicitor General who argues Dobbs in front of the course, courts is a former Thomas law clerk. The month he filed the Dobbs case, he goes to a reunion dinner with Thomas. I mean, that's like maybe grounds for recusal in any other universe. Well, and it's not just that. It's that he first filed the case solely as, a, as an attempt to move the goalpost to 15 weeks, to say, okay, well, we can start banning abortion at 15 weeks. He goes to this West Virginia resort with Clarence and Ginny Thomas. He goes back to Mississippi and he says, I've changed my mind. Now we should ask the court to overturn Roe v. Wade entirely and not bother with 15 weeks. What happened in the interim? Well, we obviously don't know. Maybe Adam will do some more reporting on that. But I think the perception is very obviously that something very sleazy went on behind the scenes. And given the justice's history of unscrupulous behavior, it's reasonable to draw those conclusions. 
Mark Joseph Stern, thank you as always for your time and analysis, sir. I appreciate it.